1 Corinthians 10, starting in verse 31, it says, So whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be saved. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. So it, it, it's the exhortation of the Apostle Paul to the church in Corinth to do everything, everything in your life for the glory of God, to not intentionally offend every person that you are around, to seek the advantage of others over yourself, to have a greater purpose than just living for some sort of weekend, a purpose to see the gospel save men and women, and then the heavy and high calling of the apostle, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. I mean, friends, could you confidently tell anyone that statement in your life? 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, could you tell your children or your grandchildren your friends, your family members, your co-workers, leaders in the community, could you tell them, hey, imitate me as, as I imitate Christ, as I am of Christ, dads, moms, could you confidently look your kids in the face and say, be imitators of me as I am of Christ? And if they did that, if people talked like you, walked like you, looked like you, would they look more like Christ? It's the haunting question as we begin this morning. I, I, th I think most of us would say, well, you got to imitate some of my life. Especially the, the things I like, but don't, don't imitate the things I hate about myself. Don't imitate that, which is fair, but it's still the high calling of, of discipleship that we can confidently tell someone, hey, start doing what I'm doing and you'll look more than like Christ than you do right now. So how can we say that? Like, how, how, how do we confidently say that? Well, Paul answered that in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, but even more clearly in Ephesians 5, 1 through 2, where he says, Therefore, be imitators of God. As beloved children, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice to God. So it begins with the imitation of God. That we live and think and become Christ-like. Is that not the goal of believers? Henry Drummond, he said it like this, to become like Christ is the only thing in the world worth caring for. The thing before which every ambition of man is folly and all lower achievement vain. Discipleship is a high calling, uh, but a necessary and required calling to, to become imitators of God. To choose what is good in your life over what is evil. So that's, that's 3 John. It's a, it's a letter, it's a brief letter that reveals to us what it means to imitate good and what it means to even imitate evil. So we'll finish this Blessed Assurance series and find out. This is 3 John. We'll tackle the whole letter. It's pretty brief. If you have a digital Bible, I'll read out of the ESV. Um, if you have a bulletin, it's all there in your bulletin before we... Read the letter. Let's pray together. Father, as, as we begin, we, we pray if, if we're children of God, if we believe in the gospel, help us to be imitators of Christ above all. That we read your word, that we, that we pray through your word, God, that, that we want to look more like Christ, that we want to love others better than we do right now. That we want to love what is true and what is righteous, God. That we want to reject the evil things of, of the age. God, help us to be imitators of you. God, that, that we could possibly tell anyone in our life right now, imitate me as I am of Christ. A, a confident statement of discipleship. God, show us what that could mean what that might mean 
as we study Third John together. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. So let's read the letter, starting in verse 1. It says, The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I, I pray that all may go well with you, that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. For I rejoice greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Beloved, it's a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are, who are testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God. For they have gone out for the sake of the name, except nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support people like these, that we may be fellow workers for the truth. I've written something to the church, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. So if, so if I come, I'll, I'll bring up what he's doing, talking wicked nonsense against us. And not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers and also stops those who want to and puts them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. We also add our testimony, and, and you know that our testimony is true. I had much to write to you, but I'd rather not write with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon, and we will talk face to face. Peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends each by name. Two weeks ago, uh, I, I shared that Second John is the second shortest book of the Bible. So it's of no surprise that, that Third John takes the gold medal. It's the shortest book in our Bible, coming in at 219 words in the Greek text. And like Second John, it's incredibly similar in its structure and approach. The primary difference is the focus on personal individuals, where Second John was written to a specific local church. Third John is written to a specific person, references two other names connected to the church. So outside of John, we have three primary personalities from the passage. We'll just go through them. There's Gaius, he's, he's one of the good guys. There's Demetrius, another one of the good guys. And there's Diotrephes, one of the bad guys, really the only bad guy. So what's the focus of the letter? Well, we, we could go through each personality, and we kind of will, but, but I want to focus on really the heart of the letter, because in reality, John summarizes the writing in verse 11. If you look at the text of verse 11, it says, Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. So, brothers and sisters in Christ, it matters how we live our lives. Doctrine is of the utmost importance, but what's the point of right doctrine if you've got wrong living? We want to be men and women that imitate the right thing. And these three personalities of the letter will show us the right thing and the wrong thing. So I want, to, I want to approach this passage a little bit differently than I usually do. I want to answer two questions. Do you imitate evil or do you imitate good? And for the sake of ending on a positive note, let's tackle the evil part first. So if you're a note taker, here we go. Do you imitate evil? Not an exhaustive list, but we can clearly see in the passage. Do you imitate evil? Here's the first one. By putting yourself first? By putting yourself first? If you look at verse 9, John says, I I've written something to the church, but Diotrephes, oh, he likes to put himself first. To begin, like, well, who is that guy? Who's this guy that he's referencing? It appears that he's either a local church leader, maybe even a leader in the church that John is writing to, but at the very least, I'd say he is under, or at least should be under, the leadership of, of John. And the very first accusation that John makes is, hey, hey, this, this guy likes to put himself first. Which I would say is first a problem because that's not the way that Jesus taught to us to live our lives. It's the parable of the wedding feast in Luke 14. 
It says this in verse 7. Now he, he being Jesus, told a parable to those who were invited. And he noticed how they, they chose the places of honor, saying to them, when you're invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this person. Then you'll begin with shame and take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So to imitate evil is to live a life that's about yourself. It's to exalt yourself over others. It's to think, to live as if everyone else is below you. It's the indictment of verse 9 that goes even deeper than that. I believe the, the New King James Version uh, really highlights the accusation a little stronger. So let me read it again. This is third, third John 9. It says, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, Who's supposed to have preeminence? Anyone? Jesus. Hey, you got Colossians 1 next week, brother. That's right. It's Christ. It's Colossians 1. Let me read verse 15. It says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He's the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. So Christ is above all. Christ is before all. So please don't imitate the leader that needs to be first in everything. That's not the posture of Christ It's actually of no irony. It's the posture of the Antichrist. It it, it is the evil of of the man or woman to put themselves first, especially a church leader. Like real leaders are humble leaders. And we have, whether it's deacons or elders or anyone that wants to be on staff, anyone on church leadership, to me, the number one quality is you got to be humble. You have to be humble. If you're not a humble leader, you need to step down or be removed from your position. And if it sounds like, we're like, oh, John seems fired up. That's because he is. Jesus didn't call him one of the sons of thunder for no reason. Don't imitate evil by putting yourself first. No one likes to be around people like that anyway. Do you t- imitate evil? Let me give you the second one. By ignoring authority. It's the, it's the next line. In verse 9, it says that he likes to put himself first and does not acknowledge our authority. What will become clear as we move on is that John wrote a letter to the church calling them to action, and this guy read that letter and ignored the prompt. So if you think, like, by logical order, that makes, that makes sense to me. When you have a man or woman that thinks they are preeminent, that they're above all, before all, well, then they just brush off any authority in their life. Whereas we like to put it today, um, even in this community, you got men and women, they they just think, well, they're above the law. It's evil, it's wicked. Or let me put it like this. Every person in this room has an authority over their life that's not just God. Flesh, blood, authority that calls the shots and holds you accountable. That could be a boss could be a parent, could be a government employee, could be a teacher, could be a coach, could be a church leader. But to deny that, that authority in and over your life, to me, it kind of proves that you're, you're already missing point one. We all have authority in our life, myself included. I'm not the only elder at this church. I'm just one of four, and my vote doesn't count more than one. Those guys have and should hold me accountable. I'm not above the rebuke or their correction or their wisdom. I submit to the elders just as much as any other person in this room. 
We have authority over our lives. So what does Scripture say? What's Romans 13, starting in verse 1? Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. But this guy, well, he doesn't care about that. He's a lone ranger. He, he thinks he's got life figured out. He doesn't need to listen to anyone, especially someone like John. So to be clear, before we move forward, like I'm not talking about ignoring evil or abusive authority. We don't tolerate authority that demands that we do something evil. And we don't tolerate abusive authority that manipulates our emotions for personal gain. We should reject authority like that. But that's not John. Like, John isn't even asking this guy to do something impossible or crazy. He is li- he's just asking them, him to be loving, to be welcoming, to be supporting to the brothers, as we will see. Don't imitate evil by ignoring authority in your life. This won't be fun to say, but there might come a time when church leadership here at East River Park holds you accountable for something. Don't ignore or reject that. We got like real quiet. All right. Uh, there might come a time when church leadership holds me accountable for something. And I pray to God that I would not ignore or reject that. We all rightly answer to someone, so don't imitate evil by ignoring authority. Do you imitate evil, let me give you point three, by spreading gossip? Spreading gossip, it gets a little uncomfortable when we get to verse 10. John says, so if I come, and we know John wants to be there face to face, if I show up, I'll bring up what he's doing, talking this wicked nonsense against us. Now, we don't know exactly what was being said, but we do know that this guy has been running his mouth against John and others in the church. We do know that this guy has been speaking wicked nonsense, and the textual evidence shows us that he's speaking wicked nonsense as a way to set himself up as leader in leadership. So so let it first be said, there is a time, there's a time to call out another leader by name. Not only did John name this guy in the letter, He also said that he would tell the church about it all when he gets a chance. So there's a time, and it shouldn't be every time, but there's a time to call out wicked leaders, specifically wicked church leaders by name who are actively seeking to destroy the work of the gospel. John's not participating in gossip when he does that. John is publicly addressing this hidden gossip that's just been going around by one man in secret. The warning of Proverbs 2019, whoever goes about slandering reveals secrets, therefore do not associate with a simple babbler. So why would Diotrephes do this? Like, why would he be talking about John like that? Well, because insecure, wicked men and women that think that they don't answer to anyone They love to tear other people down so they can build themselves up. Gossip, it first starts in the heart of a man or woman that needs validation for their own insecurities. I don't think there's a person in this room that hasn't been guilty of that at times. And once gossip rests on the heart, then it overflows from the mouth. John is fired up. He's angry, and rightly so. This man's been talking wicked nonsense. It's become a distraction to the work of the ministry, and John, he he doesn't pray it away. He doesn't start his own secret gossip club. He calls the man out by name. We don't gossip, and if anyone begins to gossip to you, you can gently say, like, hey, I I don't have ears for that. If you have an issue, you can go talk to that person. 
We don't gossip. Our speech should, should be really for building up. It's Ephesians 4, verse 29. It says, Let no corrupt talk come out of your mouths, but only such is good for building up, as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Do you imitate evil? Let me give you point four by refusing to support other ministries. The rest of verse 10 reveals the heart of the matter. Diotrephes has refused to welcome the brothers. So who are the brothers? I would say they're traveling missionaries, possibly even sent by John. And this guy is refusing to welcome them with hospitality, love, affection, prayer, resources. Why would he do that? Well, because if it's not his ministry or his team or his idea, he don't want any part of it. And what's even crazier in the text, Diotrephes isn't is kicking people out of the church that are welcoming and supporting these ministries. So here's the thing. When you're trying to build a brand, you need to protect that at all cost. In the business world, it's a wise, healthy thing to do. It's why trademarks exist. you got to protect your brand. you got to protect your ideas. you got to protect your business. If you don't do that, someone might steal those things and have the success that you have had. But friends... That's a business. This is the church. And I realize there are things that have to be run like a business, but we're not trying to build up a brand. We're trying to build the kingdom, and it's not even our kingdom. It's the kingdom of Christ. It's a wicked and evil thing to do to practice ministry in isolation because it reveals a heart that's seeking to build your own platform rather than the gospel. That's what this guy is doing. It's a warning to the church to reject leadership like that. It's a warning to leadership to not lead like that. It's evil. Do you imitate evil? All right, that's the bad news. Let me tell you the next question. Do you imitate good? I texted one of our our elders this week uh, the, the notes, just the points to review, and he said, wow, that's a lot for the shortest book. And I was like, yeah, it, it, it is. He's right, four more points. We're starting all over. We'll move real quickly. Um, if you don't like it, I'm going on sabbatical. Y'all can take a break from me anyway. So here we go. Do you imitate good? Let's start it all over. Point one, by walking in the truth. Do you imitate good by walking in the truth? The next two men listed in this passage are examples to us of imitating what is good. The first one is Gaius. More than likely, he's a man that John led to Christ along the way. He's a man that John loves in truth. You see that in verse 1. He's a man that, that, that prayed for, for good health, a healthy soul. You see that in verse 2. He's also a man that's been walking in truth. You see that in verses 3 through 4. It, it parallels what we studied last week, that this great rejoicing from John is that he's heard that some, some including Gaius, have been walking in the truth. It's 2 John 1.4. I rejoice greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth just as we were commanded by the Father. It's to walk like Christ. So as we read and study the teachings of Christ, we become more and more like Christ. That's the goal. Imitation is not to pretend to be someone else. Imitation is to model your life after someone else. For Gaius... That, that's been Christ. That's the goal, walking in the truth. Jerry Bridges, he put it like this. God's ultimate goal for us, God's ultimate goal for us, however is, however, is that we be truly conformed to the likeness of his son and our person, as well as in our standing. Jesus did not die just to save us from the penalty of sin, nor even just to make us holy in our standing before God. He died to purify himself, himself a people eager to obey him, a people eager to be transformed into his likeness, that we're being sanctified, we're being transformed, we walk in the truth, we model our lives after the way that Christ lived. Do you imitate good? So to move quick, let me give you point two. By showing hospitality. I mean, that's what John's getting at in verses 5 through 7, a faithful thing Gaius was doing. He was supporting these brothers in Christ, strangers, men, men he had never met before, had, had been showing up to the church. They were by all means traveling missionaries. Maybe John had sent them Gaius, showing them 
love and hospitality do imitate good by showing hospitality. So we'd spent a a week on the mission field. I couldn't imagine uh, the pain and the sorrow and, and the struggles that Ed and Val had been through in Honduras. They had seen really some of the ugliest sides of of humanity, and yet every night, I mean literally every night we were there, Ed and Val and their family would make dinner for our 10-person team, and they were not, we were not allowed to help, we were not allowed to clean up. It was their way of showing us verses 5 and 6, some of the team complete strangers in their own home, and yet they loved us and they served us, and I'll never forget returning back to the States and asking some of our student team, Like, what was the most impactful part of that trip? Thinking the obvious would come out, well, you know, feeding the children in the community or putting in the the cement floors at one of the local schools. But the kids, like one after another, said it, it was just eating dinner every night with Ed and Val and their family. Every Everyone said that. Just a lot of them had never even had a family dinner before. To sit down, play some cards, tell stories, and laugh together. Hospitality is far more important than we think it is. It's a work of the gospel to love, support, and welcome people into our lives. Strangers that walk into this church, how are we treating them? Do we introduce ourselves to them? Do we ask about their story? Do we listen to their needs? Do we show them kindness and respect? Or are we just so busy with our own people our own schedules, our own insecurities that we can't even show hospitality to someone else. It's a calling from the Word, specifically to the saints. It's Romans 12, 13. It says, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. It's the shocking calling of Hebrews, Hebrews 13, 2. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, and thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Like, if we need any other motivation, there might literally be angels among us taking the form of a stranger in need of hospitality. This man that John is writing to is a man to imitate because he's imitating Christ, welcoming the strangers, welcoming the brothers. And in this context, it's more than just hospitality, it's also support. Well, are you imitating good, point three, by supporting gospel ministry? It's verses seven and eight. The men have arrived before guys, were missionaries. They went out for the sake of the name, the name being Christ Jesus, and they accepted nothing among the Gentiles. Now, a Gentile, say it the obvious, a man or woman that is not Jewish, but a Gentile in this context is, is an unbeliever. Meaning these traveling missionaries accepted nothing from unbelievers. They were supported by the church. That's John's encouragement in verse 8, that it's not the world's job to support the ministry of the gospel. It's not the world's job to financially back and fund and resource gospel ministry. It's the job of the local church. That's the encouragement to guys. That, that hospitality would bleed over into continual support for the sake of gospel ministry. Thursday morning, um, I had coffee with, with a local preacher. When I, when I say coffee, it was, it was really Earl Grey tea. Don't judge me, just trying to get a little something different. And um, so I'm sitting there with this guy. He's several years younger than me. He's incredibly nice, humble, godly, insightful, wise. We usually only meet every few months, and he's just looking for feedback looking for um, encouragement, opportunity to brainstorm. Uh, And he is currently working on planting a new church in Hampton, a church that cares about expository teaching, a church that that cares about real discipleship, a a church that cares about the mission of the gospel over methodology, a healthy new church in Hampton. And I can already feel it. Why do we need another church in Hampton? Well, whether you realize it or not, the most effective form of evangelism is church planning, and every statistic proves it. So friends, we should support gospel ministry like that. 
I don't know what that means. I, I, I do know that, that it's not about East River Park. It's not supporting my ministry or, or my gospel ministry. It's gospel ministry. It's Christ. So we aren't going to be like Diotrephes. We're going to imitate Gaius. And, and I don't know exactly what that looks like for that new church plant. For me, I just said, hey, man, I'll be praying for you. And then when you have some information, like, let me know and I can just help get the word out. In many ways, it echoes the calling of 1 Corinthians 9, 14. It says, in the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. These missionaries in 3 John were not making a living off unbelievers. They were making a living not off the gospel, but by the gospel. So we want to be individuals in a church that supports gospel ministry, not just here in this building, but other churches, other individuals that care about what we care about. As verse 8 says, we ought to support people like these. We may be fellow workers in the truth. Guys, we all have the same employer. We all have the same mission. If we're going to imitate good, we should support gospel ministry. And then lastly, do you imitate good by receiving a good testimony? Introduced to the third personality of the letter, a man named Demetrius, possibly even the man that was delivering the letter to Gaius, but in verse 12, we see that he's a man of good testimony. In some ways, Demetrius is, is filling the qualifications of an elder in 1 Timothy 3, 7. It says, moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders. So he may not fall into disgrace into the snare of the devil. It was well known, but those inside and outside the church, he's a good man. I think we know plenty of people like that in our lives. Like They just have a good testimony, a good reputation in town. We trust them. With, you would trust them with your things. You would trust them to do what they say they're going to do. That was Demetrius, which is probably why he's even trusted to deliver this letter. He was trustworthy. Good testimony and a good reputation. But just as a heads up, like you don't have to be a Christian to have that. At least on the surface, you can just be one of the good old boys that everyone likes. I've heard the simple phrase, like, I've never heard anyone say anything bad about them. That's a good thing. But it's not the only thing. Because in verse 12, it says, the good testimony wasn't just from others, but from the truth itself. Since Demetrius has Christ, Christ testifies to his good testimony. I mean, what a profound statement at the end of the letter, that we become men and women, of, men and women where the truth of Christ is our good testimony, where we aren't just good people, we're Christ-like people. Do you imitate good by receiving a good testimony? So he looked at me and he asked me, what's your favorite verse? And I was nervous, but I, I locked and loaded. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And the man looked at me with approval. I was only around 10 years old. I knew the Gospel. I knew Christ died for me. I knew that Christ rose from the dead. I knew I wanted to be baptized. And this godly man, this preacher, peppered me with with questions. He was a good man. He loved his family, served the church, brought unity. He was there when people were sick or hurting. He was officiating weddings. He preached funerals. He was a good man, and I was ready to be baptized, and so I was. But that good man wasn't a perfect man. And about junior high, it came out that he had cheated on his wife with our church secretary, Brutal. Split the church wide open. You know, I, I, th I think the truth is we, we do need more men and women that are worth imitating. Like just Christ followers that are going to stay the course, that are going to give us an example of a healthy marriage, that will show us what it means to love Christ and His church, that will just be faithful to the Word year after year after year after year until they breathe their last. We need more men and women that are worth imitating. But, but church, let me be very clear. A lesson I learned a long time ago. 
imitation does not mean that we put our eternal hope or trust or faith in a man or woman. That preacher was not a monster. He was a man that got caught up in hidden sin and refused to be honest and repent. We don't put our eternal hope in a preacher. We put our eternal hope in Christ. You know, at the, at the end of the day, like I, I do hope that there are at least some good things in my life worth imitating. Maybe it's the way I read my Bible. The way I pray. Maybe it's the way I, I love my wife and my children. Maybe it's the way I manage time or finances. Maybe it's the way I treat other people. Maybe it's the way I, I share the gospel. I, I really do hope that there are some good things in my life that other people can imitate. But church, like I'm begging you, please don't put your eternal hope in me or anyone else. A 38-year-old preacher, I struggle with lust sometimes. I struggle with greed sometimes. I struggle with getting angry with my kids, saying things that I regret. I struggle with numbing my own heart with the things of this world. I struggle with patience sometimes. I struggle to slow down enough to read my Bible and pray. And you're thinking like, wow, we need to find another church. Well, there are plenty of other churches with preachers that would love to hide and lie to you. And I'm just not going to do that. I know that if I'm ever going to be faithful, I need to always be transparent. So yeah, I'm called to live above reproach. Yes, I'm called to a greater level of accountability, and our elders do an excellent job of that. There are no yes men on our elder team. We can and should imitate good in people's lives, but please, please don't put your eternal hope in a man or woman. People will let you down. I will eventually let you down. If I'm not already, you will let yourself down. You look to Christ because he will never fail you. It's Hebrews 12, 2. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and he is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. The main question, and I'll pray, will you imitate good or evil? Let's pray together.